Well, uh, my name is Barry, <coughs> excuse me, my name is Barry Loveland, and I'm here with Lana Malmsheimer, who's our videographer. And we're here on behalf of the LGBT Center of Central Pennsylvania History Project. And today is February 6th, 2017. And we're here for an oral history interview with Dr. Rachel Levine. Uh, this interview is taking place at her office in the Health and Welfare Building in Harrisburg. Um, Dr. Levine, do we have your permission to videotape and record your interview today? Yes, you do. Okay, great. Um, we also have a consent form, which I know you've already signed, so uh, if the, at the end of the interview you have any restrictions you decide you want to place okay. on it after right. you've talked, we'll, we'll see. Uh, we can review that again. Okay. So. Thank you. Great. Um, well, thank you so much for agreeing to be interviewed for the History Project. We appreciate that. Sure, it's my pleasure. Thank you for asking me. Great. Um, so I want to start at the very beginning and find out uh, when you were born, where you were born, and a little bit about your life growing up. Sure. So um, I was born on October 28th, 1957. So this is a dramatic year for me. This will be the 30th anniversary of my 30th birthday. <laughs> um, so, uh, so it's a big year, and uh, I was born in, um, it was actually Melrose, Massachusetts, um, Melrose Wakefield Hospital, but I lived in Wakefield, Massachusetts uh, as I grew up, and um, uh, my parents, uh, Melvin Levine and Lillian Levine, uh, and my sister, Bonnie Levine. Uh, and our dog, Kraka, K-R-A-K-A, Kraka, uh, grew up in Wakefield, Massachusetts. Great. Uh, tell me a little bit about your uh, family life growing up. Sure. Um, well, my, both my parents um, uh, were attorneys, uh, so my mother worked. So my, my, my very dear 92-year-old mother, uh, who lives in the Harrisburg area now, uh, was the only graduating female law student at Boston University Law School in 1946. And so that was, you know, she's been a, a, a gender role maverick uh, her whole life as she, as she worked. Um, and, um, uh, and she also volunteered for John Kennedy's congressional campaign in 1947 in Boston. Um, and my father was in World War II uh, in the Air Force. And uh, then he went to Boston University Law School, and they met in law school. Uh, and uh, were married, and then he is he was from Wakefield, Massachusetts, and so that's uh, eventually where they lived. And uh, my sister's um, about four years older than I am, and uh, then there I am in 1957 in uh, in um, you know like Leave It the Beaver country, you know, in Wakefield, Massachusetts, the suburbs in the greater Boston area. Um, I went to uh, you know kindergarten and grade school. Um, I was um, a little bullied. Um, I, 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 some of it, I think, was that um, we had, because my mother worked, that was a little different. Um, we had maybe slightly more means than others, although not significantly. Um, there might be other reasons, but uh, I was bullied a bit. Um, and uh, so my mother actually pulled me out of, uh, of uh, grade school and uh, out of school in Wakefield and out of public school in seventh grade. And I ended up going to the Pike School in Andover. Uh, my sister also had left public high school and went to Abbott Academy, which is now part of Phillips Andover. Um, so I went to a uh, private school up there. And then I went to the Belmont Hill School, uh, which is an all-male prep school in Belmont, Massachusetts. And um, it's, it's primarily a day school. Uh, there are some short-term boarders, but primarily a day school. Um, I loved Belmont Hill School, so, uh, and I was recently back there. Uh, to give a uh, quote-unquote chapel talk to the entire school again, you know, 500 boys and all of their and, and all of their teachers, um, which was which was unique and, and very interesting, and it was just great that they asked me to do that as as an alumni. Um, so, uh, and I what I told them was, you know, don't make the assumption that I didn't like Belmont Hill. Uh, I thought Belmont Hill was great. Um, and I was totally accepted at Belmont Hill. Now, I wasn't out to anyone, including myself at that time, but I, uh, I grew up uh, and, and went to high school there. Um, I, you know, um, fit in. I uh, compartmentalized any gender issues that I might have, and I 
played football and I played hockey and also did glee club and drama club and a little bit more creative um, from a performance point of view than many um, at, at, at Belmont Hill. Um, I did really very well there academically and so uh, I thought Belmont Hill was great and I told them that when I, uh, when, I, when I went back that I thought that Belmont Hill was a very just generally supportive environment although right now I think they need to do some work in terms of LGBT. Um, my first thought that something was different with me was when I was a child, about five or six years of age, uh, and it was a Superboy comic strip, uh, which I was recently talking to someone about. It was a comic strip in the early 60s uh, where Superboy meets a girl alien who he's rather snarky to, and she turns Superboy into Supergirl and Clark Kent into Clara Kent or Claire Kent. And I remember looking at that and going, that's, that's what I want when I was five. Um, no way to really conceptualize it or think about it, but I remember that. And I remember other various thoughts when I was growing up. Um, as for many uh, transgender individuals, when I, uh, when I hit puberty then, and my adolescence, then had lots more thoughts and feelings. Um, but now we're talking about the late 60s, early 70s, and there was no context for it. Um, you know, I, I had heard and read about Christine Jorgensen, and that was probably the only uh, a public reference that I could find of someone being transgender. So I didn't understand it and I compartmentalized it. I guess I'm very successful at compartmentalizing things. And um, I, you know, participated fully at Belmont Hill and I worked really hard. And then in uh, 1975, I went to Harvard College, uh, all the way down the street from Belmont Hill. And that's a well worn path from Belmont Hill to Harvard. Um, I loved Harvard um, and uh, also. Uh, so of course, went to the library to research transgender issues and found dusty psychological and psychoanalytic textbooks that seemed to indicate how crazy I was. That was not as helpful as it might have been. Mm -hmm. And so once again, you know, I compartmentalized it and um, uh, worked really hard. I, I played hockey. I rode crew. Um, not not just in house teams and in intramural. Uh, I did participate in drama, but I also was pre-med. So at some point I had to give up almost everything extracurricular and concentrate on, you know, organic chemistry and physics and biology. And, um, and then worked really hard and went on to medical school. Um, I went to Tulane Medical School in New Orleans, Louisiana. It's Tulane, not Tulane, it's Tulane. Uh, and it's New Orleans, not New Orleans. Um, and uh, was there for four years from 1979 to 1983. Uh, found that I loved pediatrics. Uh, rapidly decided I wasn't going to be a surgeon, uh, but I loved pediatrics. And then I, I had a mentor there uh, who introduced me to the new field of adolescent medicine. And I found and continue to find teenagers to be challenging and stimulating. And so uh, the idea was that I was going to go into pediatrics and then adolescent medicine. Uh, it is there that I met um, uh, my now ex-wife, um, uh, Martha Peasley Levine, and um, we got married right before um, I left uh, medical school and went on to my training in New York City. Okay. Um, well, um, during this whole time that you were in college and everything, you, you still had these feelings that you might... Sure. Uh, but uh, you just basically compartmentalize them and that's and exactly right you know what I what I've always said is, is to me gender was like a splinter in my brain you know it was it was I, I knew that something was off I, I really felt that I was a girl um, young woman that that's what I wanted to be that's how I wanted to express myself that was my gender identity although gender identity and expression were not in the vernacular at that time um, but you know, I, 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 I gradually learned that there were some other people like that, but, but nothing, you know, uh, Christine Jorgensen and Renee Richards. And that was about it um, in terms of, of my exposure to transgender um, experience. So um, I compartmentalized it. I worked really hard and, um, and uh, continued with my academic career. Yeah. So what else you, were you going to do at that time? Yeah. yeah. So once you finished at Tulane, um, you... So I went to Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City. So I uh, left New Orleans and matriculated there. And uh, Martha came up a year later um, and when she finished medical school. Um, and uh, then I did my residency, uh, my internship, my residency, and my fellowship in pediatrics and adolescent medicine at Mount Sinai. Um, 
I, uh, I had a nickname on my residency. I was called the Torpedo. Um, so I, you know, I have the capacity to work really hard. And uh, you know, during that time in my internship, we were on every third night for the year. So that meant that every third night, you'd show up at 7, 7, 6, 7 a.m. and leave the next day at around 6 or 7 p.m. So 36-hour shifts every third night for the year. And then the next two years was every fourth night. So uh, you know, we would work 80, 100, 120 hours a week. Um, so there wasn't a lot of time to think about much, actually, uh, during that time. And then I was chief resident, where I got to work 24-7, um, basically you know, almost living at the hospital for the entire year. Um, I got to have a weekend off when my father had bypass surgery, which I thought was very generous of them. Um, but I was at the hospital every day and every night, and I didn't sleep there, but I'd come back and then go back. And so uh, it was a little bit of, a, of an academic marathon. Um, so there really wasn't time to think about much. Uh, Martha was doing her residency at uh, NYU in psychiatry, and you know we 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 did our work. Um, I then stayed in New York City uh, when I finished my training, and I did several different things. So I was in practice uh, in pediatrics and adolescent medicine. Uh, I also was on staff at Lenox Hill, and I was also on staff and faculty at Mount Sinai. So continuing that work ethic, um, and uh, did many different things and. Seeing children, seeing teenagers, uh, developed a real interest not only after my fellowship in adolescent medicine um, in adolescence, but also in eating disorders, um, uh, the medical care of young people with anorexia nervosa and bulimia nervosa. Um, so uh, I did that for five more years. Uh, in the first apartment we lived in in New York City was uh, a one bedroom with a total of 400 square feet. About the size of this table, I think, would be about good. So it was like cut in the middle right there. And um, uh, one window looked into a vent. The other looked into an alley. So it was pitch dark 24-7, which was good when you had to sleep with those crazy hours. Um, and uh, we, we, we wanted to make food, and we turned on the oven once. It leaked gas, and we shut it off and never used it again for five years in training. Um, and uh, when we moved in, it was, it was quaint. And when we left, uh, it was the pit. Uh, when we left to go into our next apartment, uh, we called Moishe's Movers, Israeli moving company in New York City. And uh, Moishe's Movers came, and, um, and they were very blunt. Uh, and they looked around and they went, Puh, this is a dump. How could you live here? It's disgusting. You're a doctor. Oh, my God, such a shunda. And uh, it was, uh, yeah, then we went to our next apartment, which was, which was a palace. It was 800 square feet. Uh, with, with, a, with a southern and western view, so you could actually see light. Um, it, it, was, it was a palace to us. Um, and uh, so that's where we lived for five more years in doing practice and being on faculty at Mount Sinai. What kind of uh, time frame or years are we talking about? So we're talking, so I did my training from 1983 to 1988. Uh, three years of pediatrics, a year as chief resident, and a year doing, doing the Adolescent Medicine Fellowship. And then I was at Mount Sinai, Lenox Hill, and in the practice for five more years. So from 1988 to 1993. Okay. Right. And then um, uh, I made what I think is still my biggest transition in life, is I moved from 80th and 1st in Manhattan to central Pennsylvania in 1993. I think that the, any transition I have or will do does not equal going from Manhattan to central Pennsylvania. Uh, why did we do that? Well, um, that apartment in Manhattan, when we left in 1993, was $2,000 a month, 800 square feet, no parking. It was going to go condo, which is usually pretty good. The insider price was $325,000 for that apartment plus $1,000 a month maintenance, no parking. Um, just to your information, that apartment now goes for $1,000 per square foot, $825,000 plus maintenance, no parking. Um, so that's why you don't live in the Upper East Side of Manhattan, um, or I don't live in the Upper East Side of Manhattan. Um, so it was just challenging and expensive and difficult, so we wanted to live someplace else. and so. Um, I found um, Hershey Medical Center and actually at Polyclinic Medical Center, which is where I was based at, at that time. So uh, we escaped New York, just like the movie, and went to, um, it's a 70s reference, and then went to, um, to central Pennsylvania in 1993. Uh, at that time, I was Penn State College of Medicine faculty, but I was based at the Polyclinic Medical Center. doesn't exist now, but in the day, that's where it was. And I, um, uh, I taught 
medical students and residents, and I saw pediatric and adolescent patients and ran the clinic. So I was director of pediatrics and adolescent medicine um, uh, and uh, really enjoyed that. Um, while I was there, um, uh, there were talks about merging Harrisburg Hospital and Polyclinic Hospital, which eventually happened to form Pinnacle. The association with Hershey broke off, and I actually shifted back to the main campus in Hershey, and that was in 1996 when I went to Hershey Medical Center. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and you were continuing to be married at this point? Yeah, married the whole time. Yeah. And then I had um, my, my son, David, um, in, uh, at Polyclinic Medical Center. So he was born in 1994. And my daughter, Dana, um, uh, who was born in 1996. Okay. Um, so when you get back to Hershey, um, how has your career how Well, you so I've been us? at Hershey from 1996 on campus until I left uh, to, to come to the governor's office in 2015. So I was there 19 years. Um, I started off as, running, as uh, director of um, pediatric ambulatory services and the and director of adolescent medicine. So I started the adolescent medicine program there and ran all the pediatric clinics. And I've had many different flowing academic and professional um, opportunities at Penn State Hershey Medical Center. So uh, we started an adolescent medicine program. We uh, started an adolescent and young adult eating disorder program, for, again, for young people with anorexia and bulimia. That's a multidisciplinary program with, um, with other departments, with nutrition and psychiatry and psychology. So I learned to break down some of those, those silos um, to, to do that. Um, and all of those programs um, expanded. So now um, adolescent medicine is a division there. Uh, I was the first division chief, and the eating disorder program has expanded um, to its own office uh, about maybe f 15 years ago. And so it, uh, it's become a real thing. You know, it's a force of nature. Uh, became essentially my third child. You know? um, so uh, I also did many other things. I did all my missions, right? So I taught. I did research. I did, I did um, administration medical school admissions committee, student ombudsperson, um, sexual harassment coordinator, um, many different things at the medical school as well as at uh, the, the uh, Penn State Hershey Children's Hospital and the medical center. Great. Um, so at what point did you, uh, did, did your feelings about sure. gender Come up and, and yeah. So as I you know, as I reached that uh, the, the, that magical age of forty, um, yeah, I started to have much more feelings. It became more difficult to compartmentalize. Uh, I ended up seeing um, a, a therapist, actually Sensei Tony Stultz, who is uh, um, uh, in Harrisburg now, um, who was at the medical center and. Um, then a series of other counselors and therapists and began to explore it. So one thing I, I don't know if I, I mentioned, I have mentioned it to him, is he did a very interesting psychological little thing, technique. He, he said, you know, if he could make all those thoughts go away, he was really the first person I ever dis in depth discussed this with. So if, I t if, um, if he could make all those thoughts and feelings go away with a psychological technique, it's a thought experiment, would I do it? And I went home and thought about that for a week or two. And I came back, and to my surprise, I said, you know, I really wouldn't. It's, 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 this is part of who I am, and I'd like to integrate it in some way. Um, and uh, then he was like, okay, well, then they explore it. Now, you know, you think back, and you wonder, you know, who knew how far the rabbit hole went, to use a, a, you know, a phrase from uh, Alice in Wonderland and Through the Looking Glass. Uh, the other metaphor is, is the matrix. You know, you can get the red pill and the blue pill, and you might regret, you know, taking, taking the pill that shows you reality as it is. Well, I took that, I took that pill, and I, uh, I um, continued to work with him and then a number, a number of other counselors uh, to explore uh, gender identity and Expression and who knew how far it would go, and here I am. And uh, did you talk about any of this with your wife at yes. that point? Yes. Yeah. So yeah. I'm not going to talk about sort of my. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about my family a little bit, but I'm not going to get as that personal. Yeah. Uh, but yes, we did explore that. Mm -hmm. Yes, of okay. course. Um, and once you um, started going through the the, the therapy transition, or trans yeah, yeah um, did you? Um, 
Uh, where, where did that lead you? Or well, so uh, gradually I, uh, my appearance changed. You know, I grew my hair much longer. Um, I wore very kind of different clothes. Um, really what, what, what uh, the, 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 um, the word of mouth was, you know, uh, Dr. Levine, I mean, she, he, he, kind, of, kind of a hippie, you know. And I'd go, well, I grew up in the 60s and 70s. I used to say, you know, it's just like David Crosby, except I still have my liver, you know. So, you know, he, he said two liver transplants. Um, but, uh, but really, as I was experimenting with gender expression, and then, um, uh, you know, whatever that line is in terms of transition, I, I stepped over that line and uh, transitioned right at Penn State Hershey Medical Center as professor of pediatrics and psychiatry and chief of the division of adolescent medicine. Um, that was an amazing experience. You know, uh, Penn State Hershey was wonderful. So I had the fortune um, of, of transitioning at a academic medical center and um, at a, you know, um, at the, and at the College of Medicine. Uh, Penn State at that time and Penn State uh, Hershey Medical Center had a non-discrimination policy which um, included sexual orientation but not gender identity and expression. Uh, so I worked with the Office of Diversity and the Dean's Office, et cetera, and my chair at that time and <clears throat> to, uh, to craft a new policy, the, the quote unquote Levine policy, um, where we uh, included gender identity and expression. So, you know, uh, what I like to say is, you know, in, in terms of diversity, I mean, diversity is so powerful for any organization and diversity in all of its different aspects, um, including for sexual and gender minorities. Um, and, um, you know, you don't want to have a tolerant environment. You know, gee, thanks for tolerating me. I really appreciate that. Um, and, you know, an accepting environment is is good, but you really want to work on, on a welcoming and even a celebratory environment for diversity in all of its aspects, including for LGBTQ individuals. Um, and so, you know, uh, Hershey approached that. You know, I mean, we, we uh, I, I worked with uh, Dr. Harjit Singh, who at that time was the head of the diversity office. We, uh, I became the liaison to, the, uh, to his office for LGBT affairs. Um, I had uh, been the um, faculty advisor for the LGBT student group. We started a staff and fa uh, faculty affinity group. Uh, we started quarterly grand rounds or a quarterly LGBT lecture at the medical center. We had the gay men's chorus sing. Eventually we had the women's chorus sing. And so uh, the, the, you know, eventually there was a booth at Pride. And so um, really to, to, to help the medical center evolve, from that point of view, and I really had the full support. Um, so, you know, the concern was that I'd be fired, and that didn't happen, or that I'd be marginalized. But again, I was welcomed. I worked closely with the administration, and I was actually promoted to uh, vice chair of clinical affairs after I had transitioned. So, I think Hershey Medical Center was absolutely wonderful. Mm -hmm. Did you have any other kinds of reactions from uh, colleagues at the? You know, you know I I am been remarkably fortunate. Um, I know that not everyone for their own reasons or religious reasons didn't really agree with it, but I had remarkably little pushback and really virtually no, you know, um, no, and in fact, no confrontations. You know, I mean, some people I knew didn't really, didn't really approve, but they minded their own business and I minded my business. I, I think that um, I think that there are a lot, some of reasons for that. I think that Medical Center of Senate, you know, basically had a no tolerance policy for any type of discrimination and stigma. Um, I also think, you know, I didn't make any enemies at Penn State Hershey Medical Center. I've been overall a pretty collegial person. I did my job. I helped people when they needed help. You know, if their kids were sick, I helped them. Um, if I could do anything for them, I did. Um, and, uh, and so nobody really had it in for me. I mean, no one was like, ooh, this is the chance to get back at Levine. So everyone kind of went, oh, adolescent medicine, yeah, okay. You know, I mean, I've been a neurosurgeon. I don't know how it would have gone. But as, as a pediatric adolescent medicine specialist, it really worked, worked out remarkably well. Yeah. And in terms of any of your students, were there any? Students were great. Yeah. Uh, patients were great. Mm. Um, I remember one father came in and, you know, I said that I wanted to let you, and the father was there with his daughter, and I said I wanted to let you know that I'm transgender, I have transitioned, my name is Dr. Rachel Levine now, just kind of letting you know. And he said, okay, does this affect the care of my daughter at all? And I went, no. And he went, well, you know, I'll tell you, she's not eating, and so we have to discuss that. And I was like, you're right. This is, I mean, I'm just letting you know, and we can take it off the board, and let's talk about your daughter and the fact that she's not eating with her eating disorder. So um, really, the patients were, were wonderful. Yeah? Right. Worked out, it worked out great. Mm -hmm. uh, tell me more about the, um, 
affinity group mm -hmm. that you created? And, uh, yeah, absolutely. So uh, it was wonderful to work with the Office of Diversity on starting the faculty and staff affinity group. And we were able to, uh, to, to, to expand that group. It's still pretty small. Uh, it has been continued um, after I've left, but it's, it's, go it's going well. Uh, it has stayed pretty small. The student group kind of ebbs and flows according to how many students are interested in being, in being out and active. Um, we've always tried to include allies, of course, um, which are critically very important for our community. So, um, you know, it's kind of an LGBTQA group. Um, it was interesting, the first name of the student group was Q&A, Queers and Allies. And, when, when, and the students said they wanted to do that, and I was like, you know what? Absolutely fine. And I got four calls from the from the dean's you know the dean's office saying why are why is it queers and had to do some education to the administration that you know queer was not a negative term that it was a umbrella term and, and actually considered been taken over by the community as a positive term and so because uh, it was supposed to be Q and A like question answer yeah. queers and allies um, uh, eventually they they dropped that because people didn't react well to it so it became you know the LGBTQ student group. Very, I thought a very imaginative title. So, and uh, and it has ebbed and flowed in terms of how how many students are participating. Mm -hmm. um, but the effort continues to uh, to and, to work on it. And do they uh, have like programs and things like that? Yeah, so they? they'll have programs. Mm -hmm. um, they'll have they still have the grand rounds. They still, which I've been pleased to participate in. Uh, they have some social events. Um, they had a booth at Pride, and so it has really gone. It has really gone well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Um, so uh, you ended your uh, career there, right? Because you got appointed by the governor for this position. Yeah. So um, it was. It, it really was. You know, man, manna from heaven. It just dropped out of the sky. Uh, the opportunities uh, for this position. So uh, I had been. So one of the things I didn't mention is so um, in, in my work over the last number of years at Penn State Hershey, I, I start. I became on the board of Equality Pennsylvania, the statewide LGBT advocacy group, and eventually I was secretary of the board. I was also on the board. I guess I was vice president of the um, Capital Region Stonewall Democrats. And so I have been doing advocacy and, you know, um, uh, through that vein. Um, so um, actually there was the, uh, one of the people in Governor Wolf's campaign was also uh, had been a board member at Equality Pennsylvania. And so I was asked to be the co-chair for the Transitions Committee for Health. For Governor Elect Wolf to you know help the transition the new and uh, this new governor mm -hmm. and I would like to say is I th why did I get asked to do that because they knew I specialized in transitions you see. Um, especially with that move from New York really so we um, so we um, so I did that uh, that that work uh, with uh, Dr. Karen Hacker who is uh, a health commissioner for Allegheny County and we uh, worked with the outgoing administration of the Department of Health. We had a committee, we had meetings, we had 10,000 phone calls uh, and drafted a report for the new administration. And, and in January, as we were presenting that report, I kind of, you know, had, we had some feelers about whether I'd be interested in this position. And within a rapid period of time, I, you know, I met the, I'd been vetted, I met the um, ch uh, chief of staff, I met Governor Wolf. Um, and then I, um, you know, got a phone call on the Thursday before the inauguration saying expect a phone call the next day from Governor Wolf. The next day Governor Wolf asked me if I would be physician general and I went, yes. Uh, then it was announced on Saturday. I saw patients on Monday. The inauguration was on Tuesday and I walk in the Department of Health on Wednesday. So uh, it was quite a, a reinvention of myself, um, which I guess I like to do or I wouldn't do it. Um, and I uh, came to the Department of Health. Uh, I was able to keep my academic appointment at Penn State Hershey Medical Center, uh, but I did have to leave my clinic and my program and my patients, which I did find challenging. Um, so it's been such a pleasure to work for Governor Wolf. Uh, I'm a member of Governor Wolf's cabinet and then I'm here at the Department of Health and I support the administration and the secretary on medical issues and public health issues of every type, which we can talk about. And um, it's, been, uh, it's, it's been a really interesting experience. Um, I had to be confirmed by the overwhelmingly conservative state senate. Um, and so I had the pleasure of going to meet all the state senators, uh, which was a learning experience for me, uh, for legislative and, you know, for government. Uh, I think it was a learning experience to them to have an openly transgender woman uh, come to their chambers and talk about public health. Uh, one of the things I'm most proud of is that I was unanimously confirmed by the Pennsylvania State Senate. 
And I, so I thought that that was, that was uh, an accomplishment. Um, it was also interesting dealing with the press. I mean, I had some experience with the press at Hershey, but not a lot. Um, the press were very interested um, and uh, had lots of phone calls and stuff, which we had to manage. Um, at first, all the press was about the transgender physician general. What I couldn't figure out is who is the cisgender physician general. I mean, if there's a transgender physician general, then there should be a counterpart who's the cisgender physician general, but never, never met him or her. Um, so, uh, but eventually, you know, unless I'm bringing up the issue of, of LGBT issues, um, that's no longer included in every article. You know, I'm just Dr. Rachel Levine, physician general of Pennsylvania, who's um, advocating about health, you know, or, um, prevention of overdoses or other things. Mm -hmm. um, so at the Department of Health, there's been a num couple of different priorities of, of our work. Um, one has been opioids. And so that includes uh, prescription drug abuse, uh, heroin, and resulting overdoses. So it is really the biggest health crisis that we have in, in Pennsylvania uh, and throughout the country. Uh, in 2015, we had 3,500 overdoses. We're expected to have maybe upwards of 4,500 overdoses in 2016. Um, and so we, I've had the pleasure of working with really um, the governor's office and really all of the administration. This is all hands on deck to deal with this public health crisis and on, on all aspects of it. So that includes prevention and rescue with the medicine naloxone or Narcan and then uh, developing treatment paradigms uh, to be able to expand access uh, to treatment. Uh, one of the signature things I've done um, is under the auspices of Act 139, which is uh, David's Law, which allowed first responders and the public access to this medicine naloxone. Uh, naloxone is an antidote to an opioid overdose. So really, all it does is reverse an opioid overdose. You can't get high on it. You can't get addicted to it. So um, I signed two standing order prescriptions in 2015. The first was for first responders to have access to naloxone. Uh, since that time, police have saved upwards of 2,300 lives in Pennsylvania using naloxone. And also for the public. So actually, anyone in Pennsylvania can go to a pharmacy and obtain naloxone based upon my prescription as physician general. Who, who, would, have, who would have known that? Um, it's actually an idea I had in the first week I was here. Um, uh, and we started to talk about it. It had to be vetted by you know, uh, 475 attorneys um, to make sure that we have an army of attorneys, to make sure that it was you know, all consistent with the law. And, uh, and then I you know, was able to sign those two standing orders uh, in 2015. So work on all aspects of, of, nalox of um, naloxone, but other aspects of the open crisis. Uh, another priority has been LGBT issues. So I am very pleased to chair the, uh, the governor's LGBT work group, which is done under the auspices of the governor's policy office. We again have almost every agency that participates. Uh, we work with community groups such as um, stakeholders, such as Equality PA, uh, the Pennsylvania Youth Congress, uh, and Transcentral PA. And we are, we've worked with the Department of Human Services, We've to, within the Department of Health, with the Department of Corrections, Department of Education, Departments of Commerce, uh, you know, uh, Pennsylvania State Police, real, uh, Office of Administration, really all agencies uh, to support um, LGBT issues in the Commonwealth under the governor's leadership. The governor is, is such a strong supporter of our community. Um, in addition, uh, the bureaus of laboratory and epidemiology within the within the Department of Health report through me. So that so epidemiology is um, you know looking at um, health issues, everything from environmental epidemiology to infectious disease issues and outbreaks and health and hospital acquired infections, um, as and uh, also cancer rates and, and things like that, and then Zika virus, and then uh, the Department of Laboratories, which is the public health laboratory for the state. Um, as part of this office, I'm the, uh, the chair of the board of the Patient Safety Authority, and I have a seat on the, on the board of, of medicine, the board of osteopathic medicine, and the board of physical therapy through the Department of State. So that's all we really do. Um, so we're pretty busy. Uh, I am uh, absolutely thrilled to work with my uh, staff assistant, Sarah Boteng, um, and uh, supports, you know, work together on all of, these different, all of these different issues. And the governor's office has been, you know, absolutely fantastic. Um, I love to go out uh, and speak. Um, I'm very shy, but I'm working on it. Um, and uh, to uh, and I love public speaking. Uh, I don't know if that comes through or not, but I do like it. Mm -hmm. And so I, um, uh, I like to use humor. Uh, and sometimes people don't get that either, but I do. Um, and 
uh, to do public speaking about all of those different topics. Probably the biggest things are opioids and all of those different aspects, and then um, LGBT issues, transgender medicine issues, and been able to go to all parts of the state, and then uh, actually some uh, some meetings out of state to to talk about those issues and advocate for public health. And I assume that you are like the first high-ranking transgender person in the cabinet of Pennsylvania. That's and, correct. And probably uh, among the other states, certainly must be one of the first. One of the first. So actually, the commissioner of health for Virginia is Dr. Marissa Levine. No relation, actually. Oh. Um, and uh, so I've, had, I've met her and I'm pleased to collaborate with her. Mm -hmm. um, but um, yes, it's been, a, it's, been a, it's been an honor and a privilege. And, and I, I freely admit that I'm, I'm extremely fortunate. And uh, you said that you get a lot, have gotten a lot of attention from the press. Yeah. And, um, in terms of um, nationally, have you gotten any um, sort of national interest or coverage from um, other places? Yeah. So um, there were a, a number of articles. Uh, the uh, I, there was an article in in uh, Pennsylvania, uh, in Pittsburgh, um, uh, the Pittsburgh. Post Gazette, thank you. That's Sarah. That's uh, Post Gazette, um, who um, uh, who wrote an article that actually um, uh, received a Glad Award, um, or, or was nominated for a Glad Award. So I got to go to Glad um, in New York, you know, and um, and uh, in in, a, in formal formal dress. It was great. Um, and then there was a Washington Post article last year um, about that, which was um, which was really pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Um, let me just uh, check where I'm in my outline here. Um, and uh, are you still married? Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm divorced, okay. um, but extremely close friends um, with uh, my ex-wife, and uh, and with and you know the kids kind of split their time, and um, we all get along really well. Yeah. Um, and she's been um, absolutely supportive. Um, and uh, absolutely wonderful person, and uh, we co-parent our kids, and um, you know work things out very well. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of um, growing up, religious affiliation or anything that might have affected your upbringing. Well, or I, your... I, you know, I was um, born Jewish and uh, raised Jewish and and uh, bar mitzvahed, and um, you know you have to say now I am a man, and I was like, well, not really, <laughs> actually. I, Sort of, kind of. Um, I didn't say that. They probably wouldn't have liked that. But um, so I. Um, what uh, what branch of Judaism did you? Um, well, it, it was a conservative temple, but I would probably be reform, reform, mm -hmm. like reform, reform, reform. Yeah. yeah. So I um, and still consider myself Jewish, but I've had a strong affinity to uh, to Buddhism, um, and studied under Sensei Stultz, and um, and have a, a lot of respect and. You know, uh, also consider myself somewhat somewhat Buddhist in terms of that thought. Um, that's actually really common among sort of intellectual Jewish individuals to have an affinity to Buddhism. I don't know quite what that is, but it does. Right. It's not an uncommon co combination. Mm -hmm. um, and I assume you did not serve in the military since you didn't bring that up. I or? did not serve in the military. Yeah. Yeah. I okay. think I would have done really well in the military. Yeah. So, you know, as part of this, I can be uh, named, called general, like the attorney general. They don't say attorney, they say general. And so some people have taken that, particularly actually Ted Martin of Equality PA will call me general. And, uh, you know, I never really thought about being a general. Um, princess, maybe, you know, <laughs> as I was growing up, or queen, but not really general. So there you go. Yeah. No uniform, though. Darn. Um. And in terms of any other uh, organizational affiliations, or you mentioned Equality PA and um, transgender, uh, trans central PA. Yeah. Have been so I've had, you know, I, I had to give up my board memberships um, as in terms of conflict mm -hmm. of interest as part of this position. But I still have a lot of networking with all, really all of our uh, stakeholder and community groups um, that you've mentioned, as well as others in, in Philadelphia. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's been great. Okay. Um, as well as nationally, uh, the National Center for Transgender Equality um, and other national uh, stakeholder groups mm -hmm. and advocacy groups. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, in terms of, I know you, you probably have talked a little bit about this in your, um, um, in your remarks, but um, important events or turning points in your life, obviously the move to 
Central Pennsylvania was quite a big one. Big Very one. big. Yeah. Um, talk a little bit about your feelings of cultural uh, shift <laughs> in terms of what what it was like coming from New York yeah. to Central Pennsylvania. Um, I really enjoyed moving here um, uh, from New York City. Um, I was a little burnt from New York City. I mean, it, it can be a stressful lifestyle and expensive and sometimes rather difficult. So. Um, we always used to love going away, getting away from New York City and hiking and being out in the country. And so we decided to live. Why don't we just live there as opposed to you know going out on the weekends? Um, so uh, I loved living in Central Pennsylvania, um, and I think it's a wonderful area. Um, and uh, raised our family here, and uh, you know uh, wherever I've worked has been very supportive. And now in, in state government, so. It was really a fantastic move. I, I, I mean, I, I didn't miss New York City. Um, I, I had to go back and, you know, see a show and, you know, stay a weekend. Um, I used to not. I used to actually get a migraine headache right there when I'd cross the Hudson River. I mean, I'd be fine until you got to the Hudson River. I'd go into New York City and have a headache, which would leave when I left New York City. Um, but uh, that's no longer true. So I can enjoy going for a weekend and seeing friends and go to a show and go out to dinner. And then I'm extremely pleased to come back. Um, and what changes have you seen in the um, cultural climate or the, or the uh, social political climate, I guess, uh, for transgender yeah. people? I think that, that transgender individuals have made a tremendous amount of progress. Yet, uh, I'll talk, I do want to mention that we have a, tr a lot of progress to get more to go. Um, but, I, I mean, I ended up transitioning... Five, six years ago or so. Uh, if I think if I had tried to transition six years before that, it would have been five or six years would have been much more difficult. Um, you know, I was I was appointed two years ago. I think if that had been five, six years ago, that also would have been ex extremely difficult. Um, I think that there's much more recognition of transgender issues, uh, much more um, knowledge about them, much more and and some more understanding. Um, at the same time, um, I, I freely admit that I've been very fortunate. I think one of the reasons that, it, that things have gone so well with me is that I'm a physician, so I'm a professional, which has given me some privilege. Um, I think that, that it's, it's, it's extremely difficult for some transgender individuals, particularly um, transgender women of color. Um, I think that there have been far too many um, assaults and murders and, and, and great difficulty uh, uh, um, both professionally and personally in terms of housing, in terms of accommodations, in terms of, of employment for transgender individuals in general, but particularly transgender women of color. And I think that we need to do better uh, to, improve, um, to, to improve that uh, for all of our individuals. Uh, we have to cast a very wide, infinite net you know, um, uh, across the whole alphabet soup of our, of our rainbow family. Um, so I, I, you know, it's absolutely, absolutely critical. So I think we've made progress, but we have a lot of progress uh, to, to make. Um, so, you know, I saw that when I went to Belmont Hill, you know, so I'm standing out there talking about sexual orientation, gender identity expression to 500 boys of privilege um, in, uh, in, in uh, Belmont, Massachusetts. Um, I went back for my reunion at, at Harvard um, and spoke there. Uh, to essentially, you know, the Harvard class of 1979, which is like the masters of the universe in finance, and, uh, you know, got a, a standing ovation and, and was very well uh, accepted, uh, um, e even at Harvard University. So I think that, that things are changing, uh, but we have more progress to make. Um, I think that the new administration in Washington is a challenge. Uh, we'll see. You know, um, uh, we'll see. Um, as uh, Secretary of Health says about many things, don't run down the track to meet the train. So we'll see how difficult it is for our community. I think that that, that a number of the nominees pose, and, and the Vice President and, and some of the specific nominees pose specific challenges for our community. But we will, we will uh, we'll all work together. We'll be, we'll be unified. And we'll, uh, we'll meet it when it comes. Thank you. Um. Do you have any uh, um, materials, uh, uh, archival type materials, about your life that you feel could be shared with? Um, well, um, so, so I, I just thought it'd be fun to look at my high school yearbook picture. Mm -hmm. uh, so let me show you that. 
Um, so that's really all I brought. I didn't bring, I didn't bring you know, the Pike yearbook, the, the, the Harvard yearbook, the Tulane yearbook, et cetera. Um, but I don't know how, yeah, how you want to do this. So just show it up. Can zoom in. I'm... All right, so uh, we'll talk about it. So, you know, uh, my name was Rich Levine. So my name used to be Richard. Um, I liked uh, Star Trek, so I have this. Um, we, we all used to, draw, uh, to, draw, uh, to create a panel. At Belmont Hill, they still do that, where you carve a panel in your senior year. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I can be very creative um, in terms of uh, singing, um, in terms of theater. I've, I've been in some community theater in Harrisburg. We can talk about that. Mm -hmm. um, but from a, from a uh, art creative point of view, uh, I'm actually the black hole of, of art. So, um, so actually, even sitting here next to me, probably even watching the video, I am sucking the artistic skill out of you uh, to pass the event horizon. So I'm sorry. I apologize for that. Uh, so the, the, the person who helped us carve the panels basically put his hands over mine and kind of go, yeah, that's how you want to do it, as he, as he helped me. Um, I also um, I played, uh, I was in theater. Um, so lots of different theater and sang. I had this, I had this really nice deep baritone. Um, and then I uh, played hockey and I played football. Can you imagine me as a football player? I can't either, but I did. Um, so I told the coach, you know, I'll, I'll tackle him, but I don't want to hurt him. That wasn't quite the way they, uh, they, they wanted it. Um, and uh, I guess looking at my, uh, my quotes, uh, the Moody Blues and the band. So, uh, you know, uh, heavily into, still very much into 60s and 70s, you know, uh, classical Rock music and and uh, you know soft rock. So on, you know on, on Sirius we got the uh, we got the bridge for soft rock we, uh, of the 60s and 70s. We got classical vinyl, for classic vinyl for the for the harder rock. We got the 60s channel, the 70s channel. I'm good to go. That's it. Um, deep tracks actually for the more unusual ones. But you know unfortunately that's what I listen to all the time. Uh, you mentioned you were in the. Musical theater in Harrisburg. Yeah, so um, uh, from 2001 th uh, through about maybe seven years ago, I did a number of different plays for Theater Harrisburg and Hershey Area Playhouse and the Little Theater of Mechanicsburg. Uh, the first one was um, um, I was in um, La Caja Fall. I actually played the only straight male part in La Caja Fall. You know, irony never ceases. <laughs> uh, so I was straight, the only straight male part, the shopkeeper in La Caja Fall. Um, and then I was in Arsenic and Old Lace at Hershey Area Playhouse. I was in um, the uh, Bye Bye Birdie at Hershey Area Playhouse. Um, then I did uh, Jekyll and Hyde at Theater Harrisburg. And finally, at Little Theater of Mechanicsburg, I was in Rocky Horror, which was a hoot. I was Doc, I, I was Doc the Scott with the German accent. Yeah. So you played all male roles. This was before you I played all male roles. So yeah. It was all before I transitioned. Yeah. yeah. So I played a, essentially a male role in Rocky Horror. <laughs> what can I say? Uh, is this something that you still pursue, or is this? Well, um, it, it's rather difficult with this with this <laughs> position to do theater. Uh, in the future, you know, um, uh, maybe. Uh, I would like to do some theater. Um, I don't think I'm going to be physician general of Pennsylvania and do that. But, you know, um, I, I, I like to go to theater and uh, to listen to musical theater. And, uh, you know, who knows what in the future if I would be able to participate. I would like that in the future at some mm -hmm. point. We'll see. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, have we missed anything that you can think of that you'd like to uh, talk about or uh, bring up? Not that I know of. Um, that's a pretty complete synopsis. Um, I am uh, very grateful uh, to be able to um, be where I am. Um, I'm grateful for the uh, you know for, for the fortune that I have had. Um, I've been able. I've been given certain you know through my upbringing uh, certain opportunities, uh, and I've been able to. Um, and I've been able to take advantage of those, um, and so that's that's wonderful. Um, I am very fortunate to been, have been able to to transition and to you know express myself as I as I am uh, and as as I truly am, and that's um, that's that's a uh, it's a gift. So uh, it's good karma, what can I say? So we um, so. Uh, just keep um, trying to give back. Um, you know, what I've really tried to do in my career, and uh, that's why I've really loved my career, is really all I did was 
what I tried to do was help people, right? So see patients and help kids and families, see, um, and young adults and adults as well, um, uh, teach students how to do that, uh, do research about how to do it better, uh, create programs of how to help people better, uh, and then coming into state government to try to do that with a sort of a, just a broader brush and to um, advocate for our community, but, but advocate for public health, advocate for um, and, and help people who are suffering from the disease of addiction, um, to help people from a public health point of view in terms of in the environment and infections. And so, you know, that's what I'd really like to do and can, to continue to do. So, you know, it, it's, it's quite an adventure, and I, I, you know, I have two more years in my term, and then we'll see if, you know, hopefully knock wood that Governor Wolf is elected, and we'll see, or maybe, uh, you know, who knows what other opportunities might, might, uh, might be able to come my way, but uh, it's an adventure. I, I am grateful to my family. Uh, I'm grateful to my parents, uh, my father who's, who had passed, uh, my, my 92-year-old mother and my sister, and to, um, and to my kids, and to, uh, and to my ex-wife, and to my current girlfriend, and uh, you know, all my friends and family, my colleagues, uh, Sarah and Tina at the Department of Health, and to all of my colleagues. So nothing but goodwill, and I'm just very grateful. Right. Any other questions? Well, you could pick up. Well, one thing that occurred to me is you're a specialist in adolescent um, medicine. Yes. Is there any advice for adolescents going through? Absolutely. So I, um, so I had the privilege of seeing uh, lots of different uh, patients um, in my adolescent medicine clinic. So um, primarily we saw patients with eating disorders suffering from anorexia nervosa, bulimia nervosa and related illnesses, but I did see other patients. I did do transgender medicine uh, for, uh, for children, adolescents, and adults. Now, you know, there aren't uh, too many people in central Pennsylvania that did um, transgender medicine mm -hmm. uh, or eating disorders. So what it became, really, was adolescent medicine was anybody younger than me. And so I kept getting older. So my patients kept getting older because it was a niche. Um, so, um, so I've seen, you know, primarily children, teens, and young adults um, with eating disorders and, and for um, evaluation and, and uh, gender confirmation treatment. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, I think some of the advice is that I think it's, it's absolutely important for, uh, for young people to be able to express themselves and to, and to be who they are. It's, it's a challenging process. Uh, I wouldn't say it's easy. Is it easier? There's more knowledge. You know, we didn't have Google to go look up things, but it's not everything you read on the internet is true. I, I don't want to disillusion people, but it's not all true. So, um, so we, uh, so I think it still be, can be challenging for young people. Um, I think that we need to support young people in terms of that exploration. I think that we need to support parents and families. Um, what I found um, is that, you know, it, it's not as easy as you think to change your gender. It rocks your world, but it rocks everybody else's world, and it rocks your family's world, whether you're an adult or you're a young person. And for, for a lot of family members, it, it, it is a grieving process. They, 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 as you, if you transition, they grieve the person who you were. Now, if you're transitioning, you're like, I'm right here. Well, you know, why are you grieving me? But it's different. And uh, parents will often be grieving the son and daughter that they lost, even though um, uh, they have a new daughter and son. But they still grieve that. So uh, I think that young people have to kind of give their parents um, a, a little bit of slack and uh, to understand that process so that they that, uh, and to help them all. Um, I think it's critically important for young people to have access to uh, and adults to have access to gender confirmation treatment. Uh, so one of the things we've been able to work on um, is for Medicaid in Pennsylvania to pay for conf gender confirmation treatment. And we're working with private insurance as well to have more coverage for treatment. And then to create access for treatment in terms of um, mental health professionals, psychological professionals, medical professionals, and surgical professionals to be able to provide that care. And so we need a, a pipeline to training is, uh, to have qualified professionals as well. So insurance coverage is one aspect of it, but there's another large aspect of it. Um, so we need, to work, we need to work on that. But I think access is, is really important. Um, and I think hopefully our society will continue to, um, to understand um, uh, uh, gender, uh, the gender identity and expression uh, in a better way. Um, you know, for 99% of the people in the world, you might question many things in your life. You might question your family, your upbringing, your job, or your religion, but you don't question your gender. 
it's a fixed star in the universe. But not for us. It's always been a little bit wrong or a moving target. And then, I mean, the, the brave new world in, in terms of, of gender is, um, is gender non-conforming or gender non-binary, gender expansive individuals. The, the latest term I heard was gender creative children. I thought that was great. Um, and, um, and so I think that even in the professional world for transgender medicine, we have to, we have to learn more about gender expansive individuals and, and what, what their medical and social and, and, and psychological needs are in terms of our standards of care. And I think that that's, that's really evolving. So lots of challenges for the future. Mm -hmm. and, and are the um, medical schools responding by getting more training programs Some. developed? Yes, but you mm -hmm. know, the wheels of change move slowly. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you have to be patient yet persistent. Mm -hmm. Or as one of my uh, uh, colleagues at Penn State Hershey said, relentless. I took it as a compliment in terms of advocacy, advocacy and developing new programs. Right. Yeah. Well, this isn't quite on the same issue. Sure. But, well, you're doing a lot of work with uh, opioid addiction. Yes. How are you finding communities mm -hmm. responding to this? How do you find? Sure, absolutely. So what, what the, the critical point that you have to remember is that addiction is a, is a medical illness. It's a, it's a disease. It's not a moral failing. Addiction is a chronic, relapsing, neurological or brain disease. Uh, outlined really well if you look at the, uh, uh, the National Surgeon General's report on substance use um, uh, that was published in uh, December, January. And, um, and I think that people still misunderstand that as some sort of moral failing, and, and thus there's still a lot of stigma. So um, the, um, the entire administration advocates and goes out and tries to teach people about the disease of addiction and to erase that, and to erase that stigma. Um, the, the origin of the opioid crisis is the perfect storm of different factors. Uh, the first was the emphasis by federal regulatory authorities in the 90s and the early 2000s that the medical um, and health systems had to do a much better job assessing and treating pain, acute pain and chronic pain. And so pain became, quote unquote, the fifth vital sign, you know, um, pulse, blood pressure, respiratory rate, temperature, and pain. And we had to assess that. And unfortunately, the, the expectation was that not only were we going to assess it and treat it, but we were going to eradicate acute and chronic pain. And not only severe pain, but even mild to moderate pain. At the same time, there was the development of extremely powerful, long-acting opioid pain medications, which were marketed that they would not be addictive in patients with pain. And unfortunately, the exact opposite was true. And they proved to be extremely addictive. And so the use of these medicines went up 400% in the course of about 15 years. And again, not just for a severe pain, but also mild to moderate pain. Now, too many people took these medicines for long periods of time and became dependent and some addicted to these. Um, others didn't take it. And where did it sit? It sat in their medicine cabinet. And then anybody who could possibly have access to their medicine cabinet um, might, might, might divert it into the black market. So we had many more people through the black market become dependent and addicted to these medicines. Um, at the same time, and so we saw an uptick in terms of overdoses to these medicines. And then in the last five years, we have had the influx, the third piece of the puzzle, of cheap, powerful, and plentiful heroin from Central South America and Asia. And so the overdose rate to heroin has absolutely skyrocketed. And the last thing that we've seen now are synthetic opioids, such as fentanyl. Uh, fentanyl is an opioid that is 100 time, 50 to 100 times more powerful than morphine. Uh, and there have been um, significant rates of increases of, op of death in to, due to fentanyl. The recent outbreak in Philadelphia uh, in the Kensington area was shown to be actually fentanyl compounds, uh, artificially produced fentanyl by the cartels uh, produced in Asia. And then the newest is actually carfentanyl. Carfentanyl is literally an anesthetic designed for elephants. It's an elephant anesthetic. It is a thousand times more I'm sorry, a hundred times more powerful than fentanyl. So if you do the math, it is up to 10,000 times more powerful than morphine. And the smallest grain can lead to overdose. And again, 
produced primarily in Asia, marketed through the cartels, and used to cut, to, to, to cut the heroin. So they can use only a little bit and have it be really, really strong and it's cheaply produced. And we have had seen overdoses to the car fentanyl in Ohio and now in Pennsylvania. So this is, this is an epidemic that we have to address. So, you know, we have many different um, programs to address this. Uh, the first is what I'd like to call opioid stewardship. And the parallel is to antibiotic stewardship um, programs in health systems and hospitals. So antibiotics are necessary medicines, but because of bacterial resistance to antibiotics, we have to use them more carefully and more judiciously. Well, opioids are essential medications. And if you had an operation this morning um, at a hospital, you need an opioid. And if you were in a car accident and you broke your leg, you need an opioid. And if you have chronic cancer pain or other severe chronic pain, you need an opioid. But we have to bend the curve and use them less. And we have to use them much more carefully and much more judiciously. So we have worked with medical schools to develop programs. We've worked with professional sites to develop continuing education programs. We have developed prescribing guidelines to do that. In addition, under Secretary Karen Murphy's leadership and the leadership of uh, Deputy Secretary Lauren Hughes, we have instituted the Prescription Drug Monitoring Program, where pharmacists input each each, each medicine they dispense, and then physicians can track that. And if they see that someone has been doctor shopping, they can make an intervention. Uh, then we have naloxone to reverse the overdoses. And then it's not, not naloxone is necessary, but not sufficient. You can't have, you know, give naloxone and go back to bed. You have to, or the first responders, you know, you, these people have to go to the emergency department for further medical care, but then also for what is called a warm handoff, which is a facilitated referral for treatment. Um, to substance abuse treatment. And then we need to expand different aspects of treatment. And for opioids, we have to expand medication-assisted treatment. So I find that people are getting the message. I think our, our, um, uh, in our communities that uh, the public as well as the police, et cetera, are getting the message, but we have more work to do. Um, the, in, in the administration and the legislature, I think everyone is on board. So you could have discussions about whether we should do this program or that program, but I think everyone realizes the seriousness of the, of the epidemic, and we have worked with our communities and our counties. We have worked with the National Governors Association. We have, in other states, we have worked with the federal government, and so we all need to kind of work together, and I, I, you know, I'm a positive and optimistic person, and I think we'll make progress, but there's no quick fix, and we're in it for the long haul, and it's going to take years. Well, thank you, Dr. Levine. Thank you. We appreciate your time. My pleasure. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Great.